Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. We really appreciate it. And especially thanks to you guys that actually are standing in the back. We, uh, we, we are really appreciating that. A couple of months ago, there was an editor of a magazine who contacted me and wanted me to write a piece on um, machine learning and artificial intelligence for a specialty magazine. And I accepted because I love talking about these things. I really love machine learning and, and artificial intelligence. So I wrote a piece and I sent it over to him. And the response I got was, it's too positive. Where is the dystopian future? AI is a little scary. When I think of AI, I think of all the good things we can do. I think about all the pain points we can remove, the lives we can save. When he thought of AI, he thought of the Terminator, HAL 9000, 1984, an AI that just won't open those pod bay doors, right? And that is what most people are thinking about. Murdering robots, they will turn on us eventually. But there is another side. We will focus on, uh, on the positive side of things today for a change. No dystopian futures. Okay, a little bit, but not too much. And we will try to um, give you some inspiration to artificial intelligence and mixed reality put together. And we will start by showing you where these techniques came from, where they are now, and try to peek in into a possible future. The goal with this session is to, to show you that we can actually have a synergy effect, if you will, with these techniques. My name is Jessica Engstrom, and I focus on user experience. And my name is Jim Engstrom, and um, as you might hear on our last name, we're married. And we're also both Windows Development MVPs. We run a company called Awesome Dev, where we focus on future technologies. So our focus right now is going to be HoloLens, we're going to talk about bots and stuff like that and AI, but we also focus on UX because with all these emerging technologies UX is going to be even more important. Let's talk about where mixed reality comes from and what that actually means. There's some confusion surrounding the different realities. So the first one is virtual reality. That's when we step into the virtual world. Then we have augmented reality. That's when the digital world steps out into our world. Then we have mixed reality. Now mixed reality is kind of like augmented reality deluxe. So if I put my hologram on this table and I tip the table, that hologram would fall down. If I have a ball, for example, it would fall down onto the floor and bounce on the floor. That's the difference between augmented and mixed reality. Now, mixed the term mixed reality, some companies use augmented reality for this interaction as well. So keep in mind that some companies are going to talk about mixed reality and some companies are going to talk about augmented reality, but it's the same thing for in, in some cases. There's also mixed reality is also used when you show the player in a virtual world. So you mix the, the real world, the real player into the virtual world. So mixed reality is, is kind of a hard term to use, but uh, keep in mind that augmented mixed is probably the same thing in most cases. Augmented reality is not a new thing. In 1584, no, you didn't hear me wrong, 1584, the first publication said how you may see things in a sh help me. <laughs> how you may see in a chamber things that are not. Yeah, thank you. There we go. So in this case, you have a um, 
room beneath the stage mirroring up onto a transparent piece of glass. We know that this technology for technology was used 1862. This isn't anything new. And why am I talking about this? The really cool thing is one of the most advanced augmented reality headsets, the Meta 2, uses the same technology. They have screens up here that mirrors down into the glass beneath. 1584, this technology was invented. Now, AR became mainstream when Pokemon Go came out. I mean, my mom knows what, what why AR is. All the different companies said, hey, we want a piece of the action. So Apple released AR Kit with iOS 11. So you could create augmented reality ap application with just your phone. Google wanted a piece of the action. They released something called Tango. Now, Tango, I recently switched jobs and I got a new phone. I could choose my phone. I chose a Tango phone. Then, perhaps two weeks later, Google says, hey, we have got something new. We got AR Core. You don't need specialized hardware anymore. So, yeah. <laughs> Still got that, though. And Microsoft, of course, wanted to do the same thing. So they have view mixed reality. All these technologies have something that isn't that doesn't give the full experience. It's the real world into a camera, out through a screen, and into my eyes. We think that when this is going to be awesome and revolutionize the augmented reality industry, basically, we need to have the real world with our own eyes. Microsoft has solved this with a device called HoloLens. How many have tried the HoloLens? Not that many, right? So the HoloLens is an is a untethered computer, completely untethered. So you can walk around, you can walk outside. Well, it's going to get disturbed by the uh, by the sun's um, light, but then again. We are living in Sweden, so that's not a problem. It's a full Windows 10 computer. So you can do Excel work. You can do cute elephants in 3D. It has an amazing tracking that can track your every movement. Know wh where's the wall? Where's the floor? Where are you in relation to that? It has transparent screens. So you see the real world with your own eyes. And it's going to bounce light inside of the lenses. So if this table was a hologram, it would bounce the light off the table into my eyes as if it was actually standing there. So the holograms are really, really good. And it also has a 360 degrees very good sound. Now, we are talking about HoloLens because that's the best AR device out there right now. And what we imagine in this talk is not a HoloLens. I mean, technology evolve. It's going to get faster. It's going to get smaller. It's going to get better. And this is the device we, ima we imagine in this talk. Now, the world is way more positive when it comes to augmented reality than Jessica's story about AI in the beginning. We think about Minority Report. We think about Iron Man, because these things help people. We think of the beginning of an epic saga. The HoloLens is one of the most artificially induced devices in the world. It uses augmented reality, oh sorry, um, artificial intelligence for almost everything. What is a wall? What is a floor? Where are you in a relation? It calculates this in real time. Hand tracking. But what is AI? Jessica? Yeah. These geniuses, and my microphone, yeah, it's on. 
Perfect. So these are a couple of geniuses. Uh, this is Warren McCulloch and um, Walter Pitt. Back in 1943, they were uh, talking about uh, neural networks. Um, they cre created a computational model called threshold logic, which laid the foundation to um, neural networks as we know them today. Basically, they try to mimic the brain, the, the patterns we have in, in our brains, and apply it to uh, artificial intelligence. Um, so that's where neural network started uh, in this case. Now, the computer science area we call artificial intelligence, uh, it was um, created during a two-month study back in 1956, right? Yeah, just checking. Uh, by uh, John McCarthy and Marvin Minsky, they pushed for, for this study. Many of the attendees of this study were to become pioneers with, within artificial intelligence for decades to come. Really smart people. The goal with the study was to develop a computer that can think like a human. Yeah, so a self-thinking computer, if you will. They also discussed topics like a neural network, of course, natural language processing, computers, because back in the day, computers were not the ones we have today, right? So basically, every single buzzword we are talking about today when it comes to artificial intelligence, they, they talked about back then. They never got as far as developing a computer that can think for themselves, but they still laid the foundation, right? So we still, we still enjoy what they did. Now, the term machine learning uh, was coined in the late 50s by Arthur Samuel, who is a pioneer when it comes to artificial intelligence, but also computer games. So that's good. I like him. I like games. So machine learning is the part that um, when, when the machine or computer, if you want, the model is uh, um, learning from the data without being specifically programmed for, for a specific task. Uh, a lot of stuff ha has come up right, with um, machine learning. We have um, effective web searches. Anybody who remembers when you had to use operands in uh, browsers? No? Plus signs and yeah. Yeah. Thanks to uh, machine learning, we don't have to do that anymore. So my mom can Google all she wants. Spam filters, that's another favorite of mine. But we have it everywhere, basically. Rena Deschter uh, coined the term deep learning back in uh, 1986. So again, something that is a buzzword today, we already talked about 1986. So deep learning is based on, on uh, layers in the neural network. So a traditional neural network is one or a couple of layers, uh, and while deep learning can have hundreds and even thousands of layers that the data uh, go through to, to uh, be transformed, if you will. Uh, so the term deep goes to show how many uh, layers we have. And if pop culture has taught us anything, it is that we cannot trust artificial intelligence because they will turn on us eventually. And that's also one of the reasons I'm very, very nice to my Alexa, Google Home and Siri and all of those. I say please and thank you for real because when they turn on us, they will kill me last. So I was actually called out once in a talk. I was doing um, a talk on bots and I was called out because one of my examples said please and thank you to, uh, to the bot. And he said, I don't think you're that nice to your bots. I'm, I actually am. I do say thank you. You don't have to, but I want to be a nice person. Does anybody remember Tay.ai? Yeah, a couple of you? Yeah, this is a very good example of um, people exploiting data and uh, training with bad data, I should say. Microsoft created a bot called Tay. And uh, I would have loved to be in that meeting. Let's create a bot. Oh, that's great. We're really good with, uh, with those, those things. Let's do that. 
oh shoot, we need to train this machine. Do we have any interns that can train because my schedule is full, full, no? We don't have any? Okay. Let's put it on Twitter and let the Twitter people train it. What can go wrong? Well, I can tell you, within 24 hours, they had to remove the bot because it had become, how do I put this? Not so nice and flat out racist. Yeah, so they removed it. But if we take away that bias for a while and we put that to the side and we think about all the good things that we can use artificial intelligence for. 2017, Las Vegas had the deadliest mass shooting ever in modern US history. 850 people got wounded, 50 people died. This was horrible. The perpetrator, he stockpiled over 20 suitcases of weapons and ammunition and what have you. He also had a couple of minor bags, smaller bags and what have you during six days running up to the shooting. Now, if the rifles were to be visible, it was had been easy for a human to see that and arrest the guy, but it wasn't. And also this is a huge resort. They have a whole arsenal of themselves of people working in the hotel. So nobody noticed that this one guy brought in 20 bags during six days. If we would have a system much like, um, what do you call the system from the machine from a person of interest or minority report, if you will, it can detect anomalies that are not regular behavior for people. It can also detect emotional states. Would events like this even be possible then? Could we have saved some lives then? I believe so. We will come back once more to talk about life-saving use of AI, uh, but to lighten things up after this, Jimmy, take it away. Thank you. Schrodinger had a theory that if you lock a cat in a box with poison, the cat will be both alive and dead until you open the box. You heard about this, right? Have you ever felt a little bit hungry? And you uh, go to the fridge, you open the fridge, you check out the fridge and realize, hey, I have no food. There's nothing I can eat in here. So you close the fridge, you go about your day, but your stomach doesn't agree with you. It's go, rrr, rrr. I'm, I'm still hungry. I didn't solve the problem I had just, just then. So you go back to the fridge, you open the fridge, there's still no food in there. I, I really hope I'm not the only one that does this because this would be very awkward. So you close the fridge, you go about your business, and but you're still hungry. So you go back to the fridge and then you're a little bit smarter this time. You open the, the freezer. <laughs> you solve the problem. You open the freezer. And Brussels sprouts is not food. And then you open the fridge again. You have done this, right? Yeah, I see some nodding. I call this demo Schrodinger's fridge because you don't know as long as the fridge is closed you don't know if the food is dead or alive no wait that's a bad thing if the food is there or not so smarter has a fridge cam so when you close the fridge it's gonna snap a picture so you can take up your phone you can check the uh, your app and see if you have the food there or not but they also added AI to this. So if you take out the milk, you drink up the milk and you don't put it back, and you said that, hey, I want, I want to make sure that I always have milk, they will add that to your shopping list. That's amazing. They can also track expiration dates. They know what you have in your fridge. They can suggest dinner. So no more fighting about what's for dinner. The AI has spoken. So that solves the AI part, right? What about mixed reality? Can we add mixed reality to this? Of course we can. So this is our fridge. And yes, the fridge is an Autobot. 
So if I go to the fridge with my HoloLens, I will start the app and I will be able to see straight into the fridge. There we go. And it's empty. Now, this does not solve the potential that the food will just suddenly materialize in through the fridge. I mean, it snaps when you close the door. But you don't have to walk over to the fridge and open it all the time. You can just check the cam. Next up, we have another amazing project called Seeing AI. Have you seen that? No? Oh, awesome. So Seeing AI is a Microsoft project which, with an app, you will be able to describe the world around you. Microsoft Research has taken this and put them into a pair of glasses. So let's see, look, take a look at the video. Could you fix the sound? That's fine. Can everyone hear in the back? How cool is that? The beautiful thing is that all of these APIs are available to us as developers through cognitive services. It has an API that can recognize handwritten text, ordinary or printed text. It can recognize celebrities, face detection, age. It can recognize bills and it can even count them. You don't need to be a data scientist to do this. Apple, Google, IBM, and of course Microsoft has APIs for these kinds of applications. So let's take a look at how we could build an app like that. So the first thing we need is this NuGet package. Then in the app, we need two things. We need to snap an image and we need to analyze the image. So which one of these two do you think is the most advanced one or the most difficult? Which one takes more, most lines of codes? Getting the image or analyzing the image? Getting the image? 
a bunch, all right. Analyzing the image, and a bunch of you that doesn't believe in either or, <laughs> right? <laughs> Getting a video frame is about 30 lines of code in Unity. Analyzing the image is about six lines of code. It's five times more getting an image from the camera than getting an analysis from Azure Cognitive Services. We're going to start with what we, what we want to detect. What do I want when I send this to Azure? What do I want to get back? Then I want to define a computer vision client. I will specify an endpoint. I think I'm in the way. And then I'm just going to send the image stream to Azure, sort it by confidence, and get a result back. It's almost no lines of code to create what Microsoft Research did in the video. So this could look something like this. Right, you can't can't hear. We we actually have text to speech as well. A keyboard on the desk. Basically, no lines of code. So now we know how to do use a pre-trained model, but can we make one ourselves? Of Just course again. we can. I love this part because I can look how really smart without doing the hard work. So please don't let this get out of this room, that it's this easy. And there is a reason why we sometimes cannot use the pre-trained models we get from companies like Microsoft and, and IBM and what have you, because it is hard to see the difference between a barn owl and a sliced apple, or ice cream and caramel sauce and kittens. When we run into a problem like this, when it's hard to uh, look at those adorable things, one of them you want to eat, the other one not so much, color perhaps. But what we need to do is feed the machine with more images of kittens. Win-win situation, because I get to look at pictures of cats and the machine gets to look at kits or kittens again. again so. so if we look at it at the simplest form, we take our tagged images, we tag this with cat or ice cream. Uh, we send them, so here's the cats, we send them up to Cognitive Services on Azure, and we start training. And the machine goes through the images and works its magic. And when we are done, it's time to evaluate what's happening. And we can, with the help of a simple REST API call, send in a completely new image to uh, compare to the trained data, or we can do this in the portal as well. So we put in a new picture of a cat or a catty-corn, perhaps, and it's 93, 91, 89% sure that it's similar to these cats. So it's pretty sure that this is a cat. Now, Jimmy and I, we are uh, hosts of a podcast called Coding After Work. And the reason I'm telling you this, it's not only a shameless plug, it's also because we have a couple of questions we always ask our guests. One of them being, are you Marvel or DC? This is actually, <laughs> to be frank, a marital fight we have with, uh, going on 18 years now, I think. So it's a constant fight at home. Uh, that's why we started the Marvel DC. So let's uh, play a game. How many are preferring Marvel over DC? Oh, I like you. How many of you prefer DC over Marvel? Oh, this is great, only three hands. How many of you are un unsure which team the superheroes are, or maybe don't know what I'm talking about? A couple of, yeah, exactly. We run this into this a lot. Everybody's not as geeked out as we are. And what better than to actually train a model to classify whether a superhero is Marvel or DC. So what we are going to do is go to custom vision, a 
Apparently we are not. Now we are going to custom vision dot uh, AI, which is the portal for, for the custom vision uh, Microsoft service. This is all my projects. So I click on Marvel DC and I have pre-trained this um, model. You can see there's uh, a lot of pictures here. We have 615 DC pictures and 590 Marvel pictures. To add an image, we are lacking in uh, the Aquaman department. We only have two pictures of Aquaman. Two pictures is not enough to train a machine. So we can add an image. Let's just do one for, for show here. I tag this, which team? DC, I know, and we upload it. Usually you upload a bunch of them at a time. And this is so smart because if you are accident, if, I mean, if you're uploading a thousand images, of course, there might be a duplicate. It will figure that out and it will not duplicate the image on, uh, on the portal. So that's really, really good. We also have uh, a couple of um, iterations. You see, we have 10 different iterations here, and they all have different uh, precision and recall. Uh, this is due to what images we have trained it on and so on. You can set make default here, so you don't have to figure out in the code which iteration you want to um, go against. Uh, because sometimes you don't want the latest one because you're still training, so you might want to go with the previous version. You can, of course, also in the code, just say, I want an iteration seven. So you can do it either, either way. So the precision here in this iteration um, is if a tag is predicted, how likely is it to be right? So in this case, 96.7%, that's pretty good, I would say. And recall is out of the tag, it should have found how many of them was correct. So 96.2% in this case. We can also do a quick test here. If we don't want to uh, do a REST API call, uh, we can train it right here. So let's find an image on my computer that is not Aquaman because it has been trained on Aquaman. So which one do you want? Do you want Spider-Ham? a figurine, a Wonder Woman, the old-fashioned Batman, or I don't know what that is. Any, any preparation? Batman. Batman. Let's start with the old-school Batman. Now, this image has never been on this machine. It has never seen this. So let's do it. 83.4% sure that this is DC, which is correct, by the way. But it's a kind, kind of DC. Should we try the pink one? Yeah, because pink. 99.3% that if this was a real superhero, it would be DC, which is kind of likely because DC usually have the capes and things, right? So there's that. I, I could tell you a little oh bit no. of a story. So um, we were in a conference in Bulgaria and we were in the speaker room. And John Galloway says, hey, have you tried a picture of yourselves and upload it here? And Jessica, oh, we got to try that. So she tries and becomes like 99.9% .9 DC. I'm Marvel. I, I, I promise. <laughs> Where apparently I look the like AI it. has spoken. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> what we need to use the custom vision API uh, or this machine is this NuGet package. Everything is in NuGet package. That's so so nice. And this is the code that is necessary to get the image and get the probability on Marvel or DC. So we get a percentage. <coughs> the most important one is this one. This is what we need to analyze the image. Everything else is basically setup and and conversions and stuff like that. And you can also set your um, iteration right here if you haven't uh, set a default one or you want to change that. So we have actually put this into a HoloLens app. 
and walked ar around our, our VR AR room and it looks a little bit like this. You have to do the voice. DC. <laughs> Which is correct. This is Spider-Man. Oh, just Marvel. Marvel! <laughs> also Marvel. Ooh, Batman. DC. <laughs> He's not biased. And of course, we ended with Batman. <laughs> This is the only room in our house that can be anything because VR, AR, we call it the holodeck. <laughs> and speaking of geeky subjects, I am extremely bad with names. I am extremely bad with faces. And most of all, I am extremely bad with a combination of the two. It has gone so far that I actually introduced myself to one of Jimmy's work colleagues. And it, it went a little like this. Hi, my name is Jessica, nice to meet you. And he was like, yeah, I know. I was at your wedding, your very small wedding, a couple of weeks ago. So yeah, you, you understand how bad I am. What if we can take all my Facebook friends, the photos from Instagram, the LinkedIn, the Twitters, and I can just train a machine and I can wear one of those smart glasses or, or a mixed reality headset and I can just walk around and it would save me so much awkwardness. Also probably get sued for GDPR and stuff like that, but that's a whole other can of worms. There is actually a company that has done almost that, not to the same extent, but if you come to their office, you're fitted with a mixed reality headset and you can walk around like this and you will see that Natalia is a web developer. Here we have the next one, interaction designer. You can just walk around, you know what everybody's doing, you know what everybody's name is. It's fantastic. I so need this. Still need to get around the GDPR though. We promised you another life-saving use of AI. And this is actually one of my favorite use of artificial intelligence. It was a machine that was trained with images of, uh, from, a, from a sample slide. Uh, it was um, tagged either cancer or not cancer. After it was done training, they sent in a fresh set of images and the machine could identify cancer two years before the trained pathologist that does this every single day. Two years. That's the difference between life and death. And normally the pathologist has to go through hundreds of images, 10 megapixel images, and be responsible for every single pixel. Because if he miss <coughs> one little pixel of cancer, you could be in big trouble, right? Two years. I think that's amazing. Case Western Reserve University, they also use uh, a HoloLens. They have been using it for a couple of years, uh, especially in their anatomy classes where they are, are training uh, their students. It has saved them a lot of time before the HoloLens. It took 17 hours in the cadaver labs and of course, a lot of cadavers. Now it takes three and a half hours and no cadavers. That's pretty amazing. It has sped up their education so they can actually, in the first term, learn radiology and physical diagnosis ultrasound, which is something they used to learn a couple of years later. But their interest in the HoloLens and use with mixed reality and AI doesn't stop there. This is a typical patient monitor, but don't let the name fool you. This is not a monitor for the people. This is not for the patient. I don't know what half of these things is. What ha I, I know what my heartbeat is, but what's that? Why is that bleeping? This is a stressor for a patient because if something changed a lot, I would be like, am I going to die? Am I sick? And I would look at that every single minute. So why do we have this in the room? 
So Case Western Reserve University is working on, on a completely different project. You have a small little <coughs> IoT device that is connected to artificial intelligence in, in, uh, in the cloud, which can analyze, it can diagnose, and it can find problems in near real time, much faster than the doctor would. And we all know how busy doctors are today, right? <coughs> so this can save some, some really, um, probably save some lives. So if the machine finds a problem, the doctor is fitted with, it's called, the doctor is called, and it's fitted with a mixed reality headset, much like these, and they will become smaller, of course. And they can walk in to the room and see the patient monitor right on the screen. No need for the patient to actually be, get alarmed or wonder what all these numbers and, and bleeps are going on here. This is made with um, in Unity using Telerix uh, VR AR toolkit, so that's available to download now. So using IoT to collect the data, using AI to process the data, and mixed reality to visualize the data, we can achieve synergy. And this is what we should do going forward. We should find different technologies and try to infuse them. The machine will never stop. The machine will never get tired. And the machine will save lives. Thank you. <laughs>